Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Canola Producers Commission, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Girl. So, Keith Gobbert here with the Canola Council of Canada, uh, talking about something that we, as agronomists for the Council, really wouldn't like to address very often, and that's the fact that we've got a number of canola crops, uh, particularly in the area that I cover uh, in eastern Alberta, that look reasonably poor. We're approaching the end of July now. You wouldn't know it by the crop around me, but some crops have either failed to establish or really haven't shown the growth that we'd normally expect out of a canola crop. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it's, uh, it's region specific. Obviously eastern Alberta where we're at today is a lot drier than, than western Alberta, but it really depends what shower or what thunderstorm you were under uh, within that sort of week to three weeks after seeding. And we had a really hard time establishing our canola crop in areas that didn't get any measurable rainfall until late June. So we have some fields even in areas that we consider high moisture areas and places where the crop's quite good that haven't emerged the way they should. So if they were seeded a little shallow, if they were on some uh, on maybe a little different textured soil, a little lighter soil and they weren't seeded deep enough to access that moisture that was required to get them up and out of the ground in spring, we have fields that, that look like the field I'm standing in, where the grower is starting to look at it and say, if it's the end of July and my crop's not where it needs to be, what else might I be able to do with it? So, so if, you're, if you're looking at your canola crop and, and you're really starting to think in, uh, in the end of July where we're at, that this crop is three to four weeks behind, it may not reach maturity, it's definitely not going to make a great sample, and the quantity's really not there to have you excited about growing canola in 2015 in, in, uh, in dry land conditions, you have a couple options of one, phone your insurance adjuster and say, uh, listen, I, 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 my neighbor has cows or I have cows and I think this might be more valuable as feed than it is uh, waiting to see how much canola it might grow. So the option there is have them come out, assess the crop, tell you what, uh, what it might have yielded and use that for their records because you are going to want to stay in crop insurance in the long haul likely. At least most of the producers I deal with tell me that. If you're not in crop insurance, the other option is simply to take a look at this crop and say, if I wait to combine it, what might it have? Uh, and if we look, if we look behind us, uh, for the end of July, this particular plot could just as easily be the end of June in terms of timing on a normal year. Your yield potential is really difficult to, to assess. Uh, there's typically three main me methods that producers will talk about. Uh, and the methods are, are, are sort of related. It's how thick is the crop? If you can see the ground, most producers, regardless of what area I cover, from Lacombe to Oyen, if you can see the ground, they automatically take 10 or 15 bushels off of what they might normally have, have, uh, have expected. If you've got a potting area that's relatively short, so this crop at the end of June is, or end of July is still trying to pod, but you can try to estimate based on the number of handfuls of canola that you have what your what your bushel final bushel yield would be. I've not been real successful that, with that, but typically you have four to ten handfuls of of canola, and you'd you'd be being really optimistic to think that you're going to get there with this stand now. Uh, the other option is to count the number of pods on the main stem, and well, this is the main stem in front of my hand here, and I've got six or ten heat blasted pods and three sick ones a couple side branches. Um, without rain, this crop is not going to amount to much. So your next option is talk to the local insurance office, make sure they're on board with what you might want to do as an alternate use for this crop, because there's no requirement for you to harvest your crop, uh, even if you're in crop insurance. And then decide what, what else can I do with it. Well, as a cattle producer, you either roll it up in a bale or you put it in a silage pit. Um, sauerkraut from cabbage is really good on hot dogs. It uh, it works the same way for canola. The problem is though that this is a pretty juicy plant. So if you try to try to uh, put it in a pit without letting it dry down after you've swathed it, or if you try to cut this crop a little too early when it's mostly leaves and a few flower stalks, there's really not a whole lot of material there. So the general advice from producers that have tried it, uh, and most recently would have been probably 2002, 2003, when we had some drought conditions in central Alberta, 
is wait for this crop maybe to be done flowering or at least have some pods and some stem that you'll get a few tons out of when you when you cut that crop for silage. So um, when I talked to producers about their favorite variety in 2002, you know, a couple of them were trying to tell me which variety yielded half a ton more. And we're not talking like it's barley silage where we're measuring it in, you know, eight to 12 tons. This is gonna be a couple tons of salvage value. And the only trick is try to decide, is this a, a 10, a 20, a 25 bushel canola crop? Uh, and in the area we're standing, you know, I hate to put words in producer's mouth, but they'd be happy with 25 on some of these crops that haven't seen any real appreciable rain. So at that point, what's canola worth if you get it to the bin, if you get it to the bin, and uh, what's the possible salvage value of, of rolling it up or figuring out some way to uh, feed it to a cow.